Good morning, Mr Blake. I'm appointed to carry out assessments for employment and support allowance. Can you walk more than 50 metres? Yes. Can you raise either arm as if to put something in your top pocket? Yes. Can I ask you a question? Are you medically qualified? I've had a major heart attack. I've been told by my doctor that I'm not supposed to go back to work yet. I'm afraid you must continue to look for work or your benefit payments will be frozen. There must be some mistake. If you've been deemed fit for work, your only option is job seekers allowance. Well, I want to appeal. You have to apply online, sir. I was a carpenter. I've never been anywhere near a computer. So you need to run the mouse up the screen. No. Not now? No, not like that. I'm just going round in circles. I'm going to have to I'm ask you to leave. explain to you a situation and you don't care. I've all got right. about 12 quid in my purse. Do you know what? You've created a scene. All right, Jesus what am I Christ. To do? Who's first in this queue? I am. Do you mind if this young lass signs on first? No, no, you carry on. This isn't your concern. I want you to get out as well. It's a monumental farce, isn't it? Well, um, f f first of all, um, can I just say, um, um, apart from thanks for coming, that I think um, the idea of an arts festival alongside a political conference is a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, it's a great tribute to Momentum and, and what a brilliant group they are yeah. and what enthusiasm they've brought. So well done, Momentum. It's a fantastic <laughs> Yes, I think that there is cause for hope. Um, I think what we've got is a sliver of opportunity. Because I think the dirty tricks that we've seen so far are nothing to what's going to come. Yeah. Um, and why is that? Because Jeremy Corbyn and the group around him and the movement that he's inspired is a real threat to capital and big business. Remarkable. It's the first time in the history of the Labour Party that this has happened. The very first time. The, if you go back to um, it's the beginning of its, of its history, and Labour MPs began as they continued. When they were introduced to King George V, they were so determined to be humble, some of them went down on both knees instead of one. <laughs> And Labour MPs don't have a great record of being champions of working class interests. But this movement, this movement is something else. This is the first leader who stood alongside workers in struggle when he's on the picket line, when he's actually been the leader, not trying to build his reputation. And I think threatening to kick out um, the, the big corporations from the health service, from transport, I mean, I'd like to see the utilities, and maybe that'll be on the agenda. But from across public services, that's, that's a colossal change. Because when the welfare state was founded in 45, Athley was no left-winger. He was on the right wing of the party. He sent troops in to break strikes, Clement Athley. He had a terrible foreign policy. And when the welfare state was, was uh, founded, the Tories kept it in place because they needed people to be well housed and healthy because there was a lot of work to do. But this now is something different. This is something different. We've got a tiny opportunity and my God, we've got to make it work. Sorry, I have to stand up, but you're quite short on image, so. Um, and and I, I think what's fascinating too is Kenny and myself will be traveling around Europe too and I think there are m massive, massive dangers and massive opportunities. I mean, I think it is quite terrifying to see what might happen in the next French elections. I don't know if you've seen the result recently in Berlin, there was 11% for an openly fascist party. Um, but there's another thing that you also pick up too from travelling, and that is an absolute fury at the way the world is carved up. I'm now 65, 
um, individual billionaires who own the same as the half of pop as half the population of the world. And um, and it's not an abstract question. Now. I think we saw a very very good example of this very very recently when the, the when the European Commission um, said that Apple, who are paying one percent of tax in Ireland, you know, had to pay thirteen billion, a tiny fraction of what they actually make. And when people find out they've only been paying one percent. I think there's a fury because there's actually a connection with Daniel Blake and the world that they have carved up. Why are welfare authorities and, um, and budgets being, being under pressure throughout the whole of Europe? It's because so many of these big corporations are not paying the fair share of tax. And what we have is a class of servile politicians like we see in Ireland who are actually outraged that they've been awarded 13 billion. <coughs> when we were doing Jimmy's Hall, we met old women who, and um, older pet people who are showing me their appointment cards for appointments two years in advance and being told not to turn up more than 15 minutes early. It was like a kind of a surreal play. So I think a lot of people feel that there is, the world is being carved up in the most vicious fashion and I think the great thing about Corbyn is that it gives people hope that there is actually a, a way that they can articulate this and join something that is moving forward instead of being left with hopelessness. So I hope, I hope you take, take advantage. Um, for my part, I mean, I'm a stand-up comedian and uh, this was the first film I ever did. And uh, I remember Ken saying to me on the first day, um, in these scenes, you and Haley, all you have to do is listen to each other and you'll find the truth. And I think that... Um, can be taken for all of us that we don't listen to each other, that we don't really listen to each other, why people are angry, why people feel uh, left um, by the wayside. And I think now, if we start listening, really listening, then we will find the truth and hopefully things will change. And I think, you know, things like, for instance, we have to change uh, the media. For years, there's been, you know, um, negative stories put in the press about how badly the the health services is performing. They've been undercut. The staff morale's down there. It's it's set up to fail. Same with welfare. That they, they've changed the working class fighting against each other to blaming each other. And I think if we start listening to people, um, then we will find the truth. And hopefully, like I say, um, things will change. I think. I hey, hey. Thank you. If you could show your hand, please. Ricky, this woman here, woman here for the first three, yeah. Hang on, on Rick, there's a microphone. <laughs> Mine isn't a question, really, Ken. I haven't been one of the few actors who've appeared in more than one of your movies. And I haven't shown my ass in both of them, by the way. I just suggest we've got to get the message across. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm being. I'm well known in Liverpool for being mean. <laughs> but if you would like to get a dozen or 20 copies of that made and send to every member of the cabinet, okay. I'll fucking pay for it, okay? when I lived there in the 90s um, and France has been a major refuge to me and I just wondered like with the cast what the French investment in the film meant but also like I joined the Labour Party because Jeremy did inspire hope but I feel there are a couple of things missing for me and one is about Europe and it's about the false democracy that was Brexit and actually really fighting for that and like given Ken your career and how European investment has allowed so much more distribution of your films. I just wondered if you could say something about Europe and, and the Labour Party. Great question. Um, I, I think uh, it, it, is a, it is a good question. Uh, I think the, the European Union um, is quite complicated for the left because on the one hand, the European Union is a neoliberal organisation. Yes, it is. Here, here. 
there's a, an imperative to privatise this in the European directives, I'm sure mm. you, you know, well, everyone knows. The, the, the compulsion to privatise, compulsion to outsource private um, subcontract public services to private contractors, open it up for tenders. Now that, that's obviously disastrous for, for us and for, our, um, for all our public services. It, does, it cheapens labour, it cheapens the services, and so on, makes workers vulnerable. Um, think also what they did to Greece, where they forced Greece to take a loan, which Greece had no chance of paying back. So therefore all their public assets are being uh, opened up and sold off to big corporations. Really ripped off, I mean destroyed. The democracy in Greece was ignored. Um, so the European Union, as an economic organisation, is not one, it, one you need serious, serious changes, mm -hmm. fundamental changes. But of course alongside that are two things. First of all, uh, we need solidarity with the uh, other movements in Europe, like Syriza, like Podemos in Spain, um, and other left movements like the Linka in Germany. So yes, we need solidarity with the Europeans, people, working class, and political movements. And also, and I think we're going to find this out, that the, the alternative to being in the European Union is being out, and being out under a right-wing Tory government is going to be worse. So I think that's true. So I voted to remain, but I think it's not... For the left, you can't just say, yes, everything in Europe is brilliant, because it isn't. So I think it was a complicated message, whereas the right, of course, it's always simple, blame the other fellow, blame the immigrants, blame the, different, the people who are different. So that, that was, uh, that's an easy message for people who are alienated, feel nobody listens to them, and are looking for a cheap answer. And, and so it, it was a complicated issue, but uh, we, of course we should have stayed. I think what I found when I've been going around with the film um, in Europe and a lot of the film festivals, and after the film's been shown, people have come up to me and said, thank you for this film, this is happening in Spain, this is happening in Italy, this is happening in Slovakia, this is happening in Sarajevo. So, you know, it's not just happening in England, and, and you know, they have a different welfare system, but it's this whole, across Europe, I think this, for one of the this bullshit austerity mm. that has been rammed down people's throats, and it's happening all over, and, it, 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 and that's why the reaction that you've given to this film tonight has been right away across the board in Europe. People have been exactly like you because of this, you know, austerity and people feeling that they're being made to pay for something that they they just need help with, you know? So I think that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as somebody who's come here to try and organise the fight against the, the Tories Housing Act. There's two things, if I can sneak in two bits. Um, one is the what that really were moving to me is the way that housing was presented as a proper real thing with proper decent people living in it who stick up for each other and all that. And I don't know whether you've got any reflections on the, role, the part of housing in that whole story. But also, my, the favourite bit to me in a way is he says, I, Daniel Blake, demand. And that word, that we demand, is like we need to get that back in our lexicon. And I don't know whether you can say anything about how, I don't think filmmakers need to tell us how to organise our lives, but how this relates to what we all actually go and do out on the streets and in our communities, so never mind waiting for Jeremy Corbyn to do it for us. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the favourite characters of, here we go again. <laughs> uh, just what you said, there was Frederick Douglass, the wonderful activist, the black freedom fighter was born obviously, he said, power concedes nothing without demand. It never did, and it never will. 
And I think that's what we've seen through history, isn't it? You know, the suffragette movement, the trade union movement, people are looking for all social rights everywhere. I mean, it's, we have to articulate it, and then we have to demand it, and then mm. organise it. And uh, many, many people um, have said that. But that speech, if ever you get a chance to look it up in Wikipedia by Frederick Douglass, um, I think it will give you great joy, and it's a, it's a great lesson. I think it's, um, it was uh, the main part of my research actually was talking to women who were living in homeless hostels. I spoke to a friend of mine and he, he said, well, what do you mean by home? I don't understand what you mean. How can you have a homeless hostel? Where are all these homeless people? Homeless doesn't mean they're living on the streets. It means they are without a home. Mm -hmm. They are without a home that they are safe and warm in, that they can pay for, that they want to pay for, that they can bring their children up, children up, put their children to bed at night safe and warm and happy. Um, and that we was asked asked a question next door. I didn't respond to him in in return um, in regards to education. And I think these words housing, education, everything else gets thrown around like it's a business term. Mm. A house is something for someone to live in, live their life in, um, that they pay into, that they are, as I say, safe, warm, happy, that they can bring a family up in. And that's a, and it's a massive part of society. And I think. When we talk about housing and talk about education, it's, talk, it's spoken about in business terms. Education is spoken about in business terms. Schools are run nowadays as businesses, and they're not. They're they're the only havens that children for a lot of children are the only havens they have. It's a haven of education. A house is a is a haven that each person deserves to have, and shouldn't just be spoken about in a way that it's just something that's written on something to be be discussed as a policy or be discussed as you know, I can't articulate very well because I get really angry about it. But. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, a woman at the back here, and then a woman in front of her. Yeah. And we'll just apologise, Daniel's got to leave the room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for the film, it was amazing. Don't believe for a minute that it's not really like that. I've come from Newcastle to Liverpool to watch a film about Newcastle. It has the biggest food bank in the country. And I live 25 miles away in a Tory stronghold, and we have a food bank that cannot cope with the demand. So I would just like to make the point that food banks are being used by lots and lots of people who are not unemployed, who are not in receipt of benefit, who are working people. And I think this is a really, really important fact that needs to be brought to everybody's attention. Because a food bank should not should be something that we use in a crisis. For most people, it's a weekly and everyday experience. And that is a scandal in our nation. And it's happening everywhere. since the world began and you tell people about food banks they don't know so when we're out because most people here are on the left I'd imagine when we're out talking to people and they just glaze over because they think that we're left wing activists talk to them about food banks because nobody who's civilised would say that that is a good thing that people use them on a regular basis they actually think about what is essentially the normalization of food banks that they are just becoming a, an acceptable part of society instead of the abhorrence that they really should be yeah, yeah. Um, um, so, um, it's to do with the struggle for ideas isn't it? It, it is to do with how we're manipulated mm. um, I mean Tories like the idea of charity mm. yeah, they, they like yeah. the idea of the lady of the estate going around at Christmas time with sweets for the tenants children. <laughs> that, that's the idea um, and they like it they like charity it makes them feel good and and we've actually got to stand up for that and we, we have a the, the same issue crops up again and again and it's the issue of how we communicate because the press <coughs> is uniformly <coughs> against Jeremy Corbyn and the, the ideas that he stands for even the particular the guard even the guy. Um, yeah. Yeah. You'll see hostile pieces type day after day. The BBC is is absolutely hostile. 
Um, just one example of that. When I got off the train at Lime Street, there was a, I got sussed out. There was a BBC camera uh, interviewer, and the question was, um, because I, I saw the couple of sequences of Jeremy Corbyn speaking to supporters, just mm. quiet conversation, but very simple, very straightforward. The question for the BBC interviewer was, I hear your films, I think your film of Jeremy Corbyn is being challenged because you haven't tackled the anti-Semitic. Yeah. <laughs> now that's the BBC, and that's what they take out. And that's the malevolence yeah. and the viciousness of their campaign. Yeah. So that's what we've got to deal with, you know, and it won't let up. So it's a question of, of when you say how do we get things out, the only way I think that we're going to do it is by people mobilizing, mm -hmm. being active in the community, having stalls on Saturday, delivering leaflets, speaking to people at work, in the schools, in the communities. We've got to be a, a bloody big force of communicators within our communities. It's the only way we're going to do it because the, the public discourse is absolutely hostile yeah. and it's going to get worse. So it's down to us really. We have to do it. We have to do it. In response to what you said about food banks, I completely agree with you. I think it's a, an area that um, even if you are, if you are somebody who's kind of left wing, you may not be educated on. I certainly wasn't before I started the film. Um, and I went along to the food bank in Newcastle, which is shown here, and it is one of the largest food banks in Britain. Um, all of the people that you see in the queue waiting outside are people who use the food banks, and everybody inside are people who work there or use the food banks. Um, the, what happens to Katie in the film when she eats the beans is something that is a story that um, Paul was told a woman did. Um, when he was researching the film. And I think it's a really important point to make that um, I have conversations with people. I, come from, I live in a working class area and I come from a working class background and it's all about the division within the working class. It's about them arguing amongst themselves. It's about this idea of working class people who go out to work who pay for those working class people who don't. Mm. And I had to explain to my mum that and my mum looks after a lot of children who go hungry in the job that she does. I explained to her that you can't just turn up to a food bank to demand your portion. Mm -hmm. You have to be referred by a social worker or by a doctor to be able to even be seen to get a loaf of bread or to get mm -hmm. some baked beans or to get some pasta. Mm -hmm. So, and I went to the food bank before we shot this scene and it was the hardest part of the research, probably harder than shooting anything we shot, was going to the food bank when we weren't shooting and speaking to people who use it and who work there. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor, what class you consider yourself to be, nobody wants to be there. Mm. Nobody wants to be there having to do what they do what they do to be able to get food and to feed themselves and them, their children. And thank God they have it as a haven that they do with the Trust and Trust Fund mm. um, and the people who work there are extraordinary. And something actually happened while we were about to shoot there. there was, wasn't it Ian Duncan Smith came out and saying that he was going to go into food banks and set up um, schemes to get people back into work so they were able to feed themselves. So there was a massive threat that these, and they are havens, I keep using the word, they are havens that these people can go to with these beautiful people who work there for them. This man was going to go in and enforce um, back to work job schemes so that you didn't have to go there and get your pasta or your tin of beans to feed your children. Um, yeah, so edu educate people on food banks, absolutely, because unfortunately it, isn't, it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon, so what we need is people to be educated on these things. Thank you. Uh, the woman on the, in front of the first woman who spoke, the woman here then uh, hands the hand over there, gentlemen, back, okay. Thanks, Thanks very, very much. much. Um, I'm still feeling sick after, after watching, watching that film. It was... It, it was, was the emotional punch as it um, its headline there. I, I think, think it was fantastic for, for all the wrong reasons. But um, my concern is my daughter came home from school last year and she brought her homework diary home with her. And these are given out by the local education authority. And in two of the pages, it's written about sanctions. And the word is headlined in bold. And it goes through two pages of sanctions that will happen to these children in school if they don't do their homework or if they don't do, um, if they don't get 
attendance or the uniform isn't up to standard. And these are going, these are in Liverpool, these are homework days for secondary school children. That are Sorry. I, I suspect they're nationally, but it's it's a mindset education. It's it's a way that I, I actually wrote in my daughter's homework diary and I sent it back and I said, change the word and this is an important way to address children and say your behaviour, if it's not productive, etc. etc. If you're not dressed the same way, you will face sanctions. And she's thirteen and already she understands what a punitive sanction will be in her life. So I absolutely fully support what you've just said there, Ken, that it, it is, it, it's got to go into schools, that these children need to know this information. Like I think I think Paul wants to answer that, but I think that goes to the heart of it, doesn't it? It's learning to labour all over again. The point is, it, it's the use of language yeah. and training people for the future. Yeah. Horrible story. Yeah. Thanks, for your, thanks for your comments. And I think you've touched on something that's very, very important. Because um, Ken and myself, we, we talk to people up and down the country. What was remarkable about going to the food banks, and they are contradictory places because, you know, we shouldn't have food banks, we shouldn't mm. need them. But there are havens of great solidarity where people are not isolated and come into contact with, with other people to give them practical advice and just to be listened to as a human being because when they go to the job centres, and I know this is like very close to Newcastle, but I mean that they're actually, they're, there is an atmosphere of intimidation. And I don't know how many times we met people and we saw them. We, I work with a, a group in, in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Coalition Against Poverty. And you know, and they accompanied vulnerable, vulnerable claimants to some of their meetings, and you'd see them trembling. You'd see them trembling, and frightened, and, and uh, literally shaking. And you think, like, you know, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. We're picking and bullying our most vulnerable people. You know, but then when you talk to academics as well, they told us that um, disabled people had suffered six times more from the cuts than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Then you read statements from um, civil servants talking about low-lying fruit. And you just see the systematic nature of the cruelty which is planned and it does make your blood boil. Mm -hmm. And then you talk to whistleblowers inside the DWP who are humiliated too by what they do. And then you find out that they don't do what they're told, they're put on something called PIP, a personal improvement plan. Mm -hmm. And we had the most remarkable thing I've ever heard in my life there, just after the previous screening, I went to the loo. And there's this guy having a piss, and I swear to God, he goes, I can't believe it, I used to work at DWP. I've just watched my life up there, and I stood up to them. And you know what? I ended up in a food bank too. And you'd swear I was making that up, but that just happened just 15 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened, there's so many good people inside the mm -hmm. DWP who are humiliated. Mm -hmm. They never get any promotion. There's pressure put on them if they join the trade union. And again, it just shows you the culture of fear and sanction, mm. and it makes you ask the really, really big question, why are they doing that to people? Mm. Is it because perhaps they might take on a zero-hour contract? Is it because when they go into a job, they might not join a trade union? So you're right, they have, it's a political decision to humiliate and to frighten people, and they have to give them confidence to fight back. Thanks, Sheila. Ken, um, film is fantastic. Um, I'm a trade unionist and a socialist, and the film makes me angry. It makes me angry because, as the fifth richest economy that we are having to deal with this on a daily basis. We have children going hungry during the school mm. summer holidays, and I don't think that we can wait until 2020 for the general election. I think we need to agitate and mobilize to get rid of these bastards out of power, okay? <laughs> Oh, there, there, sorry, yes. If you pass it back here, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, no, no first of all, the woman here, can you show your hand, please? Yes, thank you, she was <laughs> next. Um, hi, you, you, usually I hate whenever people use this to, to make comments and not ask questions, which people on the left always do, but, um, so, but I thought that I couldn't um, basically let the, oppor the opportunity go. Um, anybody else 
in this room uh, or in the other cinema who has uh, gone through the process of sanctions and gone through the process of the DWP and ESA and them stripping you of every single last bit of dignity that you, you have until you're basically suicidal and want to die because, because, because it's that bad. This is the first time that anything I've seen or read anything that has come even slightly close to making sure that other people um, even have a little bit of an idea of what that's like. Um, Sorry, that's not a question, but um, yeah. And the, the second thing as well is that uh, I organise with a sex worker collective uh, called Sex Worker Open University. Um, and along with English Collective of Prostitutes, we have been trying to talk about for years, since 2010, how the number of people uh, doing sex work as a last resort and when they don't want to. Um, We've been trying to talk about how that's directly, directly linked to austerity and welfare reform and food, and food banks. And n nobody has listened, including all of the women in the fucking Labour Party. Um, and it has been a long, long process of trying to get any, of those, any women MPs to listen to sex workers talking about this. Um, and, you know, I don't know, maybe I have a vain bit of hope that, that, that this will make them you know, pick up the phone and actually come and come and come and meet us. But um, yeah, so thank you very much. Very powerful comment. <laughs> I, I just just to answer you uh, that it's not a vote catch up. Work I've done myself will, has been pushed under the carpet around sex workers because it's not a vote catcher. So I feel your pain on that. Point about um, what you're, you're saying about sex workers. Um, it's something that we've, we, uh, the three of us, have spoken about quite a lot, um, and we've we've read different articles and there's been different letters written into papers. There is a, a severe um, lack of understanding about it. And the only thing that I can say to really answer you is this: when I found out, I didn't know the way Ken works is that you don't. He doesn't give you a script. It's a great fun. <laughs> um, so, um, he feeds you bits of information as you go and, and you and you learn as you go what's going to happen to your character and I found out midway through what was going to happen to Katie and straight away Paul got on the phone to me and he said he said that he'd, he, again this is all everything you see is based on, on research and, and real people um, and the three of us came to a decision where to for her to, for my own mindset to switch to that it's the only way she can take control in a system that is putting her from pillar to post when she's got two children to feed. There really needs to be an understanding of um, women that have to make that choice. Instead of just making it fucking illegal, then there needs to be a real under understanding from female, from female politicians and from male politicians and from, and from activists and anybody else that's working in that, in that area that just making it illegal is not going to help anybody. It needs to be another thing. Uh, the gentleman towards the back of his... Thanks. Um, I'd like to pick up on something that you said, Ken, about the BBC and anti-Semitism. And then I'd like to ask a question. Um, I don't know if people know, but free speech on Israel is a group which has actually been not accepted by the conference and not even by Momentum. And they are a Jewish socialist group against the anti-Corbyn witch hunt. Um, Anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism is their slogan. And I'd like to point out that on Sunday, um, half past seven, in the Novotel Hotel on Hanover Street, that they have a, a, a meeting. Um, I think people should know about that. My question is, I only cried when Anne, the um, woman from the DWP, I think, was in the funeral service. I wonder if anybody can explain why. Why did that make me cry? <laughs> <laughs> any, any takers? <laughs>
One, one thing ab about your um, your first point, um, I've got the leaflet it too. Um, uh, I think it's um, I think this anti-Semitism charge is deeply disgusting. Mm. Yeah. I've been in many party <laughs> meetings, union meetings, <coughs> labour groups, um, Arnold Trot. <laughs> I've been in meetings everywhere all my life. I have never heard an anti-Semitic remark, and if anyone had made it, their feet wouldn't have touched the ground. It's an old trick. Hannah Arendt, the great uh, writer, spoke about it back at the time that Israel was founded. That if you criticize Zionism, they conflate it with anti-Semitism. Mm. And they've always done it, and it's a trick. The press go along with it, they dance to the same tune, because it's a way of attacking Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. And we should absolutely stand shoulder to shoulder on that issue. Thank you. Well, actually, I think the second part of the operation is really, really important. Yeah. Um, and I think our capacity to empathise is something that is really remarkable in these days of cruelty and lies and viciousness. Mm. And it's the capacity to see the other. Yeah. And I think when we see that, then it touches us. Mm. And I think when we see the world now divided up, you know, into such cruelty, especially when you look at what's going on just now in Europe, you see all these fascist movements go around the place and then they look for simple answers, whether it's Trump or whether it's the, that new movement now just been given 4-11% in Berlin and they blame the other. And I think when we, when we try and analyse things and then we see people trying to understand and make an effort to cross the line, like that woman in the job centre, mm. and she empathises and she understands. I think it gives us all hope because it emphasises <coughs> our common humanity. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for another fantastic film by all of you. It was great, great to see. Um, it's a film which could have been made for the 80s as well because my, my dad worked in shot and steel works and um, he was very much a practical man and um, couldn't cope with signing on and all the form process but what I would say is what the difference today is people feel so much more isolated um, there were unions back then they were strong I know it was the end of the unions and a lot of them were, were, were defeated and are slowly coming back but what resonated with me was this this feeling of people being so isolated. Um, they only had each, each other. They didn't have an, a union to go to. Um, and what do the panel feel about that? I mean, do we need to build unions within, within the society as a whole? I know there's a, a group called Unite Community, which seems to be doing a lot of fantastic stuff. Um, so maybe it's, it's something we need, we need to build on. Thanks, I've got a claim investment in that because I'm the coordinator for the North West Region for Unite Community. Um, would the panellists like to comment? Okay, um, one more question I think because then I think we've got to wrap it up. So. Hi, I'm sorry. Um, I think Ken's expecting this because uh, my comrade Nia sent him a text. Um, and apologies that I am taking a slight advantage here but it is important. Speaking about what was just said, in fact, and it's an incredible film, I cried through most of it, so I'm quite emotional. Um, I'm a cinema worker and a member of the same union as uh, Ken Bektu. Uh, today, right now, in fact, uh, my colleagues at the Ritzy in Brixton are on strike uh, for the living wage. Oh, yeah. the same as all other employees of the company. Three years ago, we submitted a pay claim for the living wage. And when the company said no, we went on strike 13 times over four months and ended up winning a 26% pay rise for our members. Yeah. It was the most incredible, transformative, liberating experience that any of us have ever gone through. Um, and this time, when the company, of we didn't get the living wage, 26% didn't even get us to that. Um, so this time we submitted a pay claim with more things tacked on uh, this year 
Uh, the company refused to negotiate, so we're uh, on strike again. Um, but this time, uh, back two members at Hackney Picture House, a part of the same chain, are now balloting for strike action, or balloting for strike action. And then starting next week, um, the workers at the flagship uh, Central Picture House in Shaftesbury Avenue will start balloting. This cinema that you're sitting in now is run by the same chain, Picture House Cinemas. Not the whole centre, but the cinema part. We now want to send a message to every cinema worker in the Picture House chain to join Bet2 and to join our fight. We want to spread the struggle, not just to the whole Picture House chain, but to the Cine World chain, which owns Picture House, and beyond to every cinema worker in this country. But we're going to need your help because we're a small group of workers in a tiny union with only 26,000 members and not much money. We want to mobilise people in momentum and in the trade union movement all over the country to get outside picture houses and city worlds and talk to the workers and help us recruit them and help us organise. And I really believe, and I'm biased obviously, but I really believe that this could be a wave of strikes that transforms the trade union movement uh, in a way that maybe nothing else has and God knows it needs it, um, at least as much as the Labour Party needs sorting out. <laughs> question asked at the last uh, screening was around how we get this out to the wider community and um, yeah, sure. um, Ken do you want to say about Ben and Ewan? Uh, yes, um, we've got an extraordinary distributor on this film E1 and they've done something that uh, is the first time it's ever been done in my, in my experience um, and that is that as well as showing it in cinemas, we, it's going to be made available to any community organisation, to any, um, any group who want to show it. If you want a special showing at the cinema, you can arrange it. Um, and there's a man here specially charged with facilitating this, and his name is Ben, and this is Ben. <laughs> But, but ben, ben will tell you, if you're interested in, in, uh, in having it screened or can suggest to other people they might have a screening or just spread the word, yes, we definitely we want it to happen. We will do everything we can to make it happen, to, particularly to go to those areas where the people will not go to art houses. Either it's expensive or it seems like another country mm. or they can't even get the transport. We want it to be in the communities where people are dependent where there are people that are having a hard time. So please, see Ben, and we can make it happen. So th that's terrific. One other thing on, on the Red Sea strike. The main thing we've got to do is not cross their picket line. Yeah. And they put a picket line out, make certain we don't cross it. Mm. And um, that's really important. They're a great bunch. Um, I know them at the Red Sea. They're, they're a terrific group of people. Very brave, very courageous. Um, and Sydney World is a great multinational corporation. They need huge profits. For sure they can afford a living wage. Mm -hmm. So let's make certain you win. Um, in closing, I'd just like to highlight the uh, campaign and the march for the women's Save the Liverpool Women's Hospital tomorrow. Starting from the Women's Hospital, passing the Blackie and down to the Pierhead. Please stop, join in at some point. It begins at 12 o'clock. I would just like to thank the panel for the sensitive and accurate acting, which was amazing. Mm. Um, for concern I want you to get out as well it's a monumental force isn't it looking for non-existent jobs and all it does is humiliate me you've done nothing to be ashamed of you're alone with two kids you've done amazing I've seen it before good people on the street you could lose everything well, I'm not going to give up. When you lose your self-respect, 
Il donne fort. Yeah!